When you're an artist like Joni Mitchell, you uh, exemplify what you have to do to really make your mark in the entertainment business. There are a million imitators out there. When you can come up with something that is so unique that a radio announcer doesn't have to say who the record is by, people know it's a Joni Mitchell tune. The way she writes, the way she sings, everything that she does is Joni Mitchell. Nobody else out there does it that way. I think that's all I've really got to say. Something unique. We're so proud that she comes from our province, and we're even prouder that she chose to come back with us this weekend and spend a little time. The award we're about to give her, this, uh, you spend, I don't know how many years you've been in the business, I don't know if you even want to talk about that, but you spend... <laughs> I don't, I don't. <laughs> Actually, before, before we just carry on with this, we were talking about some of the people that had really made it in the business from Saskatchewan, and uh, you didn't phone me about the country guys. Do you realize that Canada's first television star was a guy that came out of Swift Current, Saskatchewan, named King Gannon? Wore the rhinestone suits. When he used to dance around on the stage, the women would go nuts. <laughs> it's been a long time since women win nuts over a fiddle player, I want to say. <laughs> but the bottom line is that if you really work hard at it, and if you really go out there and make your mark and become a mega, mega superstar, we'll bring you back to Saskatoon and give you a glass dish. <laughs> this, of course, incorporates the Saskatchewan Recording Industry Association logo, and it's our Lifetime Achievement Award, and I couldn't think of a better person to present it to than Joni Mitchell. This is the latest song. This is, this is the last song I've written. Uh, I sat out in the land in British Columbia. I've got nine songs in the can ready for the next album. I needed the tenth one. And I have a caretaker who looks after my land up there when I'm not there. And he had said to me, sucking on his pipe, that, that he, I'm nocturnal, you know, I, I'm like gonna keep vampires hours. And he suggested to me that, that uh, I'm quite cheerful in the daytime, but when I sit up and write my music at night, it comes out all melancholy. And he, sucked on his pipe and suggested that I write more in the daylight. <laughs> so I, I sat out on a rock and I, uh, I, I play in open tunings and uh, they're raga-ish in that I tune to the environment. So I tuned to the environment that particular day uh, to the Canada geese and the, the, the duck mating calls. And um, I came up with a tuning which is the broadest one that I have. It's got a B-flat on the bottom for you musicians out here and I think an E-flat on the top. So it's fairly wide as guitars go. And that was the, the tonality of that particular day at that particular place. And the chord progression is not too melancholy. It's not exactly major, 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 but it's, uh, I'll, I'll play uh, the thing. It sat around for about two weeks with no lyrics on it. And I made a terrible mistake one day. When I was buying my groceries at the local market, I bought a newspaper. From. <laughs> And there was a French page story that came out of Dublin um, about a scandal which ended in 1970. It was a kind of a Dickens story uh, in Ireland between the beginning of the last century and 1970. Women who were considered amoral or immoral um, were sentenced to drudgery in a syndicated laundry chain called the Magdalene Laundries. <clears throat> The laundries had been closed all over Ireland in 1970, but in, in just this year, the, the, the order, um, our sisters of the Lady of Charity had sold 11 and a half acres to a real estate developer. And in plowing, in we're getting ready to develop the land, they unearthed 130 women's bodies in unmarked graves, <clears throat> which raised the scandal level in the country up to a kind of a roar again. And the touching thing about it was, to me, was that unmarried women in some very, very moralistic parishes could be sentenced to a life of palest drudgery under Dickens-like conditions for life simply because they were unmarried and the men were looking at them. So I took these nice changes and I put this rather tragic 
subtext to it in the daylight. <laughs> I mean, it could have been quite a cheery song, you know. <laughs> I apologize for my voice. I was up late last night to being rowdy. I was an unmarried girl. I just turned 27. When they sent me to the sisters for the way men looked at me Branded as a Jezebel, I knew I was not bound for heaven I'd be cast in shame into the Magdalene laundries Most girls come here pregnant Some by their own fathers Bridget got that belly by her parish priest We're trying to get things white as snow For our last woe-begotten daughters In the steam and ditch of the Magdalene Arms Is like me, unpaid labor, sentenced into dreamless drudgery. Why do they call this heartless place Our Lady of Charity? Oh, charity, where is charity? Bloodless brides of Jesus, if they had just once glimpsed their groom, then they'd know. And they drop the stones concealed behind their rosaries. They wilt the grass they walk upon, they leech the light out of the room. They drive us down the drain at the Magdalene Lawn. died today she was a cheeky girl a flirt they stuffed her in a hole surely to god you'd think at least some bells should ring one day i'm gonna die here too and they will plant me in the dirt like some lame boy Come in the spring.
I guess the first thing I'd like to say is um, I'd just like you to pinch me because I can't believe I'm you know, up here this <laughs> it's, uh It's a real pleasure having you come home, oh, I guess. It's been so fun, really. Right. Thank you, everybody. I mean, we had, we had a great time last night. We discovered where the dart boards are in the pinball machines. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, what we're going to do here is really have a conversation uh, like we would around the, the kitchen table, That's I good. guess. That's you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess where we'd like to start is places like Creelman and Maidstone, Saskatchewan, and North okay. Battleford. And back then, in those days of, um, of great interest uh, to a lot of people in Saskatchewan around the world, kind of what influenced, how that influenced you? And oh, yeah, the prairie is, uh, well, the sky. <laughs> Maureen and I talked about it. She's an English immigrant, and, and coming from Northwestern England, she felt exposed here initially, but she'd come from uh, in the enclosure of the water and the embrace of the mountains into this terrifically flat place. But having come up here and knowing this first, other places seem initially enclosing. It's like the reversal, you know. And um, I think of how the sky here influenced us. I remember playing in Regina. I was in a duo then with my first husband, like the Elizabeth Taylor of rock here. Chuck <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell. Um, and uh, we, we were playing a concert there when it began to rain really heavily, and it was a one-story building. And we were playing quite nicely, I do believe, but the whole audience got out and went to look at the rain. So how could we compete with that? Everybody was looking at the sky saying, oh, gee, it's not a good time of the year for the crops. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> was that uh, the sky and the landscape and that, was that part of the inspiration that, that pulled you to art and to interpret it? Or Actually, it was Walt Disney, I think. It was Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see Bambi, and I don't know how old I was, but it horrified me that his mother died. <laughs> and I came home and I painted forest fires for days. Just tra it traumatized me, and I had to paint these fires. It was like... Terrific. That was, I think, the beginning, wouldn't you say, Mom, like of, of like compulsive drawing. Yeah. Were you, were you nocturnal then also? Or? Yeah. <laughs> it just got worse, but I, I, I guess I was pretty much born that way. I missed a lot of morning school. By the time I got to art school, I, I, I missed nearly every morning. And, uh, and then it just got worse and worse. <laughs> or better and better. But the night is good for thinking. And, uh, I was under siege, you know, in Los Angeles, there's, we all draw down lunatics on ourselves, and I had one particularly, well, one or two at the same time, but one particularly aggressive one, so I became the night watchman, even though I lived under armed guard for several years. He lived in the bushes next to the place, and when the guard changed, because there were no protection laws at that time, this was prior for st there were no stalking laws, so I pretty much listened for every twig snap for a long time, and that accelerated my nocturnalness. So raccoons must have haunted you then, I think. Well, the worst was one night, um, I, my bedroom at that time was on the ground floor, and you know, Ella being the, 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 natural, the natural disaster capital of the world, something is always fault. Trees are falling, floods are coming, mud is sliding, and fires are raging. This was the year of a, of a great flood, and part of my yard had exploded and dumped itself on my neighbor's roof below. And so there was a gap in the wall around the house, and uh, th there's a lot of wildlife up in the hills because the s these small towns have grown together, and there are cougars and coyotes and deer in there. And I was lying in bed, and I heard a rustling in the bushes outside the window, and I lay real alert for a long time until I it was kind of fight or flight, you know, and I thought, that's it, I've had it with this guy. And I lunged towards the window and threw back the curtains, and there stood three deer eating my rose bushes. <laughs> <laughs> when you were uh, painting back then, were you always working with watercolor, or did you have uh, No, I didn't really work in watercolor. Um, I worked in oils. Mm -hmm. um, I, people think the only uh, watercolor was the, the Court and Spark cover. That's watercolor and ink, but everything else is gouache. Or, um, or oils, or acrylic sometimes, too. When I when started to work abstractly, I worked with acrylic because it was a thicker material for the texture I needed. Um, have, you ever, have, you ever, have you ever sculpted at all? Or? 
Um, I'm so into color. <clears throat> Not that you couldn't apply color to sculpture, but no, I haven't really ventured into that. Okay, I, I guess the thing that I would like to focus on a little bit is uh, maybe the pursuit of, of, of truth through art. Or Do you believe that really good art has hidden truths in it that maybe become self-evident um, through the exhibition of it? The truth and beauty is kind of the essence of the pursuit, I think, although <clears throat> falsehood and ugliness like is giving it a good run right now. <laughs> <laughs> Say, don't look at me when you say that. Nothing personal, but if the shit Well, who, who were your musical inspirations? I, uh, did you listen to the radio at night while you were painting? And yeah, painting? as a kid, I used to take it under the covers and turn it down. Like the Saskatoon stations would shut down about 12 or something. There was one really strong Texas station that would wave in and out. And, it, you know, between 1 and 3 in the morning. That's why I was always, like, kind of dopey in Mr. Heinet's class. Forgive me, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there would be, you could hear the hit parade four months in advance and things, so it would give you an air of a clairvoyant. <laughs> a musical visionary. <laughs> So were there, were there favorites at all, Joni, that... Uh, yeah. That really... um, the first record that I had to have, absolutely had to have, was a classical piece of music. Um, at that time, we were living in North Battleford, and my best friend was a musical protege, Frankie McKittrick. He, he, his feet could barely reach the pedals of the, piano, the, the church organ, but he could play the thing. And we had gone to a, a movie Kirk Douglas was in. I, mer I remember very little about the movie. Um, it was called The Story of Three Loves, and the theme was Rachmaninoff's um, Variations on a Theme by Paganini. Beautiful melody. I had to have that record. And at that time, you could go down and you could go into a listening booth and play. And I used to go down and listen to it in, in the booth and finally acquired it. So that was my first piece of inspirational music. The second thing I heard, I was at a birthday party for a little, little girl named Helen Lafreniere, who lived in a tin shack on the outskirts of town. Her mother was a single parent and not well. It was something, I don't know what she had, but she had red around the rings of her eyes. And that birthday party was the first cake mix cake I'd ever had. I came back raving and my mother was horrified with her <laughs> make it from scratch methods. You know, it was pink icing, it was all pink. And uh, while we were sitting around in this little shanty having this birthday party, Lafreniere was her name, and the French station was on in the kitchen. And I heard Edith Piaf for the first time. Trocloche. Correct me, Bob. How do you say that? Trocloche. Oh, not bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, I, I, all the hair on my arms stood up when she, her voice comes boiling up from the bottom of this men's choir. That was the second influential piece of music, I would say. Then rock and roll was born, and Chuck Berry. And at that point, um, I was about 12, I think, Karen. We were seventh grade when that hit, seventh or eighth. And, and rock and roll dancing became an obsession. And, and um, so I went from listening and musical raptures and melody to really like active rhythm for most of my teens. Um, when you started out, I think uh, you started on, was it bass ukulele? Uh, Baritone ukulele. Baritone ukulele. For $36. I couldn't afford a guitar. Uh, did you buy it? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Did you get it at the Army and Navy? Or? <laughs> no, I got it at, oh, what was his name? The jazz music? Gordy Grants. Yeah, I got it at Gordy's. Uh, fine tradition there in this community with that name there. Mm -hmm. A lot of musical inspiration. Did you teach yourself or did you get a book? Or? <clears throat> I got um, Pete Seeger, How to Play Folk Style Guitar, and I tried to teach myself from that cotton picking. I couldn't get my thumb to go like that. It always had a mind of its own, and I developed kind of a a version of that, but um, also in high school, I got introduced to Miles Davis. Brian Anderson had me paint. They, he and some of the boys that I danced with went to New York and came back all dressed up like beatniks, you know, <laughs> and sandals and berets and striped T-shirts. And he wanted a mural of, of a jazz trio on his bedroom wall, and he paid me in jazz records. <clears throat> and um, so that began to leak in. And Lambert Hendricks and Ross, somebody gave me that, I think, for doing a UNICEF Christmas card. So I was bartering art for jazz in my teens. 
Well, um, when you were doing that, and um, did you ever tell Pete Seeger thanks for teaching me how to play? Yeah, yeah, I've met yeah. Pete, and, and yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, I guess the next. For trying to teach me. Yeah. <laughs> So the next step then brought you into kind of uh, a folk genre, I guess. Yeah, I started off as a folk singer. It was easy, you know, within six months I was a professional well. <laughs> and, uh, and in art school there was a folk uh, campus organization just for fun. And I ended up traveling to Edmonton there and, and make, picking up a little pin money on the weekends. Um, it wasn't until I crossed the border that my own music began to come in, and it was no longer folk music, but it was steeped in all different kinds of music, and <coughs> kind of funneling out classical and jazz, and um, then it began to change. Um, when was it that you discovered that basically your unique tunings, or was it the, your ear that, that brought you to those tunings, or did somebody else tutor you, or? Well, there were, there were certain tunings that were kicked around. There, you know, the Hawaiians had a slack key tradition. That was mainly major chords. And the old black blues, Robert Johnson, um, playing that, those cheap apocrates that they had to, to make them musical, they, they developed certain op open G, which Keith Richards plays in pretty much exclusively. Open C was known, or there was a D modal. Buffy St. Marie had a couple of tunings of her own. Uh, Eric Anderson showed me well, demodal, that was just kicking around everywhere, but Eric showed me open G tuning, and then I began to tune to the chords that I heard in my head, which were more like um, my favorite pocket of Miles. It began, it was my interpretation once again of a pocket of music, but it really wasn't the same harmony. Uh, it, it had elements of country harmony, hybrid with jazz harmony, hybrid with um, classical architecture, and you know, it, it's different. It didn't belong to a tradition, really. I'm going to ask a long question so you can like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we find you now down in maybe the north northeastern states. I guess it would be um, mid '60s or so. Did you run into Buffy St. Marie at that time? And, yes. Uh, and, and was she very actively aware of her Saskatchewan roots at that time? Or? No, no, not not at that time. Um, she used to play at the Chessmate in Detroit, and that was kind of like, Chuck Mitchell and I were the resident artists there, so we played there quite regularly, and whenever Buffy played, I went down, and she and Tom Rush were the first artists to begin to sing my songs and carry them around, which enabled, it, it opened up my club circuit. It was hard to get in there without a record deal and, without, and being an unknown, but where they went, my songs went. Initially, it was Circle Game, and I think Buffy did Song to a Seagull, and, and um, so the songs began to travel, and, and they, opened, they paved the way for club work on the eastern seaboard, primarily. So when a song, some of the songs started to get a life of their own, go out there, and, and you would go out to perform, and people would start singing along with you and stuff like that, did that really give you a perspective on, on, on what good music and, and poetry could do to uh, kind of in, uh, enhance the human spirit? Or? Uh. I don't know exactly when I began to take it seriously. It was kind of just a lark initially. I think it was when, I think it, well, a lot I owe to Kratzman. I think he made me take it seriously in the seventh grade in a certain way, but then I forgot about that. But once you began to record and, and then, then the work really began to travel internationally, you realized that you had a public voice, or I did, and I felt a responsibility to that. And I'm a double Scorpio. We are very secretive by nature. Um, it was a peculiar transition to become a kind of a public confessor, but something that Kratzman said, which I later discovered to be uh, an idea, thus makes Zarathustra, the German philosopher Nietzsche, he told me in, in the seventh grade to write in my own blood, which is basically what Zarathustra says, having completely slandered the poets, rips them to shreds, you know, like, and then the last statement is, I see a new type of poet, and he's a penitent of spirit, and he writes in his own blood. So basically, Nietzsche's feeling at the turn of the century was that poetry was basically adulterated with shimmers and a lot of, of, of they muddy their waters that they might appear deep was one of the things he said. Some pretty funny stuff. I've looked among them for an honest man and all I've dredged up are old gods' heads, old gods' heads. So it's pretty scathing and the poets at the time really objected to it, but I found that it rang incredibly true. 
And the, the duty of the poet in, in this latter part of the century was the illumination of the, the spirit. And although it was the antithesis of, of the, the pop posture, I was going to have to do it in the pop arena. Um, I was talking to Roy Arbison well, maybe about 10 years ago and I asked him what really his secret of music was. And he said that he took opera and he put it over top of pop music. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that, kind of think of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there, is there a, an analogy or a metaphor that would apply also to, to your music? And well, I, I, you know, not that I read the complete works of, but, but I can try to use Shakespeare as my pace runner, you know, or Yeats, uh, linguistically for the sound of the words, um, Dylan also. Um, but there aren't a lot of real literary writers in, in song. There are good songwriters, you know, and I always liked songs and never confused them with poetry. At a certain point, <clears throat> I decided, though, that I wanted to set poetry to music because so many of the poets really wanted to have their songs sung. Yeats, um, you know, tried to do it, couldn't do it. Anne Sexton, um, you know, so feeling. It's a good marriage if you can do it. If you have both the gifts, then, then it's a blessing, kind of. So was it, was it poetry that, um, that your grade six or seven teacher were, the, was, I, I think I, I've heard that this was kind of a turning point for you that you were writing. He was an Australian teacher. You said his name was Kratzman? And, mm -hmm. and uh, where, was that up in North Battleford? Uh, no, that was here in Queen Elizabeth, in oh, public Queen school Elizabeth, system. In Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. Was it poetry that you were writing that at this point happened, maybe where you experienced the paradigm or, or? I went for a mark. I never cared about marks. Ah. I got turned off of the whole idea of marking in the first grade. <laughs> and Your mom and dad are laughing a lot about that. <laughs> well, this woman, innocently enough, what happened was there was this huge curve of population in North Battleford as the baby boomers hit the school system. So they had to annex the parish hall, they called it, and they dredged an old lady who was a nice old lady, but oh, she was like, you know, well-meaning. Um, she, in the first few weeks of school, tested us on everything, I guess, and then decided to put the A students into the outer row against the wall and call them the Bluebirds and the B students in the next row, and they were the Robins, and then there were the Wrens. I believe I was a Wren, and then there were the Crows. And, <laughs> at the bluebirds and I thought, I don't like any of them. <laughs> I like the clothes. <laughs> and, and I kind of, I can't remember exactly how the words were formulated in my mind, but the essence of what I thought at that moment, I, I just rebelled. I thought, you know, from, from here on in, I don't care about Marx. You know, whatever that prize is, I'm not going for it. And the thing that gave me the courage to do it, we had to draw a three-dimensional doghouse. And I thought mine was pretty good. So I said, OK, this is, I'm good at this. I'll do this, you know, and I'll, I'll draw my strength. So it was pretty hard to ridicule me into being scholarly. But when we got to the, to the seventh grade, and Karen and I reminisced this not that long ago, a couple of months ago, because she was in the same class. And um, into the room came this guy. Well, first I met him in the sixth grade. I was putting up some drawings for a parent teacher day, and he came up to me in the hall. And he said to me, you like to paint? I said, yes. He said, uh, if you can paint with a brush, you can paint with words. Now, you, to give a kid that age permission to do two things is a wonderful thing. You know, I met George O'Keefe in her 90s, and she said to me, well, I would have liked to have been a musician, but you can't do both. Because for her to be a painter at the turn of the century was enough for a woman, in a way. And I said to her, oh, yes, you can. And she leaned forward, and she said, really? <laughs> I mean, she was, and I thought, the old bird is going to be taking up the fiddle any minute. <laughs> Anyway, he gave me this permission, and then the next time we met was the first day of school in the seventh grade, and he came through the door, and he said, his first words were, this whole year's course is a bunch of crap. I can cram you for it in the last two weeks of school, and you'll all pass by, with flying colors. 
And I thought, a bunch of crap. You know? It's all a bunch of crap. You know? It's like, he knows it's a bunch of crap. So I was just totally alert. Then he said, OK, I'm going to teach you what I know. I don't know much, but I know my name. He wrote his name on the board. And he said, and, and I know Australia because I'm from Australia. It's a grace note in this year. So he didn't use exactly that word, but you know, it's a minor subject this year, but we're going to make it a major subject. Then he said, and I hate these desks. He said, somebody go pull the blinds down. Oh, I thought I hate these desks too. So he pulled the blinds down. We shoved all of the desks back. And it was so conspiratorial, plus he cursed. And <laughs> we, we all loved the fact that he cursed, you know. And he, he felt us out really quickly. Well, anyway, in the course of the year, he made an assignment. And, and it was always fun when he gave us, first of all, he sat down every morning and he read us Rudyard Kipling's Kim, which for me was a very inflammatory text because it was a child with total freedom who knew his city more than well. And this town was very cliquish and we were not allowed really to deviate from our neighbor. It was isolation within isolation. Here was a kid who knew his whole city and could go through you know, the Ukrainian area, and the, he could go anywhere, you know, and, and he did it through disguises. He just you know, he, he was a citizen of, of, the, of his city, you know, uh, and real inflammatory stuff. And he then would smother the, the blackboard with writing. Do you remember the topics that he'd put on? He knew his class very well. And there was one boy who sat across the aisle from me who drew daggers through squashed toads all day long. <laughs> he had a very violent nature, and he finally went to Dunder and to boot camp. Right? He could score. <laughs> Pure military material. <laughs> and he would have, like, squash toads would be one of the topics for writing on the board. So he had something for everybody there. And uh, I went for a mark for the first time. I, I, wanted, I wanted his approval. So I wrote a very ambitious poem, and uh, it was a stretch of vocabulary, which I got from probably from the Reader's Digest and with Mum's help. Uh, equine, I think Mum contributed an adjective to, to it, which was pretty ambitious for an 11-year-old. Anyway, I, I turned this poem in. I can remember the first stanza of it. It was quite long. And when the marks came back on it, he gave me, I think, an A- minus or something, but he gave the squash toad guy in A+. Plus. <laughs> so I, I stayed after school to contest it. And I said to him, you know, did you like my poem? He said, yeah, I thought it was very good. I said, um, did you like the, the squash toad poem? Yes, he said it was very good for him. I said, did you think it was better than mine? Oh, no, he said. I said, well, you gave him an A plus and you gave me an A minus. And he said to me, oh, well, but that's the best poem he'll ever write. <laughs> And he had circled all over this thing, cliché, cliché, cliché. So and I'll tell you the first stanza. It went, uh, softly now the saffron colors of the day fade and are replaced by silver gray as God prepares his world for night. And high upon a silver shadowed hill, circled, you've used that adjective already. Um, <laughs> high upon a silver shadowed hill, an equine statue bathed in silver light. Uh, Equine mum's contribution. Very good adjective, he put. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was like cliche, cliche, cliche. He marked me like, like a fourth year college student, you know? So, um, it, yeah, he was a very good teacher. And, and we, all, we all loved him. He made teachers, he made athletes, and he made writers, you know? <clears throat> so, obviously, he was right about your poetry that you could do better and did do better. So um, I guess the next thing I wanted to ask was, in relationship to that, that, that as, as your life as an artist evolved and you were writing and you've gone through transitions and stuff, like especially into your, your Mingus phase, I guess what I could call, um, were, were there some illuminating moments for you that, that you felt that um, you may have a muse, that you, you may be having a, a synchronistic um, occurrence? Uh, oh, gee. Yeah. yeah. Synchronicity, I don't recall noticing it till a certain point in my life. I can almost remember the day that I began to notice it, and the more I noticed it, the more it increased. So it seemed that the world got more and more mysterious. Um, 
by by the more you noticed it, the more uh, the more it seemed. Yeah, <laughs> and um, was that was that is that maybe also to um, the context of deja vu and, and I've never had a deja vu, ah. but I've had four prophetic dreams and and um, I've never worn a watch in my life, <clears throat> um, so I have kind of peculiarly good timing to some, not to watch wearers. <laughs> you know, you can be late by the clock, but you can be just, oh, I could tell you hundreds of stories about like natural timing, you know, natural timing. Um, I know that we don't want to uh, confuse um, hospitality or endurance as hospitality, and we don't want to take up too much of your time. Oh, you'll time. have a hard time wearing it down. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> Till they flick the lights. <laughs> <laughs> Last call. <laughs> I guess I just wanted to ask a couple quick questions okay. about songwriting because it's something that I really like to do, and sometimes I go in and out and not being able to do it and suffer writer's block or angst about it or it goes away from me and I can't seem to bring it back, and then it does come back, and you know. Well, writer's block, I haven't suffered because I use a farmer's trick. I, uh, you know, I crop rotate, you know, <laughs> and, and I paint, you know. I'll go to the painting, and, and sometimes in the course of painting, which is a kind of a nonverbal thing, especially after eight hours of painting, the, the head gets very quiet, almost in like synapses, almost electrical sound. <laughs> Red in the upper left-hand corner. <laughs> You, in that way, you give the brain a rest because uh, writing is the opposite. You have to, you, you, you have to, by Zen standards anyway, you, you have to stir up an insane mind. You have to create chaos and overlapping thoughts. I think that's why a lot of writers are drunks or opium addicts or, you know, something to stir up the chemistry, the, the chemistry so, so that you can snatch out of the, the multitude of things that are flying around up there. Do some of the songs, do you feel they write themselves or pass through you, or do you feel a real internal or external influence sometimes? Then? I'm aware of the element of craft, but the magic comes in in, 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 in the rhyming. Like sometimes, you, you, you know, since frequently I'm trying to describe something that I've actually seen, uh, the thrill of it all is, is that within that context, that, that the words that rhyme are absolutely right. You know, every once in a while you'll find, okay, it's, it's hard to get at that idea. You've got a line you like and it's designated to rhyme and the, in the puzzle of it all, eh, the, the, the rhymes that are given there, no matter how you meditate on them, you can't quite get your idea to, to use those things available. On, on the other hand, sometimes it's just kind of, they're all there for you. Um, you told us earlier that you've got about nine or ten songs for your next album and um, are, are you shopping for a new label? Or are you on? Are you're still on your current label, or? I could stay with Geffen. I've been with him most of, you know. Well, I've been with him in one way or another all of our adult life because David and I. He was my agent initially. Then he started the, the second company that I was on. Then he got bored with it and sold it and left me there. Then he started another one, and. Um, in, in a certain way, he's, we have a kind of a brother-sister relationship, so, but he's a cheap brother. Yeah. <laughs> so he's offered me slavery with tenure, you know, so I said that, you know, David, you know, he said, Joni, you can record for me till you're 70. And I said, you know, slavery with 10 years. I, I, let me go. I want to shop around. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I think we've got time for a couple quick questions from the audience. And I'll play Oprah here and run a mic over. Here. <laughs> does somebody want to stick their hand up and ask anything here? Well, there you go. Nobody does. So. <laughs> there is one back there, Brian. Come on over here, will you? Stupid question, though, which I want to Oh, I love stupid questions. <laughs> basically, how, how did you become such a fabulous songwriter? <laughs> Thank you. First, um, oh, I didn't like it so hard. Um, 
Hmm. Well, mom and dad are pretty articulate, you know, like, uh, I think it's the Irish blood, maybe. I'm sorry, Pop. <laughs> I don't know. The Blarney Stone? I don't know. Um, my standards are high. I'll, I'll tell you maybe a trick that's useful. I want to tell you something useful. Um, I learned best through admiration of things. If I admire something, I become very interested and alert and absorb a lot. Ooh, that's really good. And it makes me want to try it. Then you never are as good as what you've admired initially when you try it. So they, you measure the distance. Oh, gee, it's disappointing. Gee, you know, it's not as good as what I admired. Why? What's the difference? And narrow the gap. You know, just keep narrowing the gap. Um, my early work had too many adjectives in it. My early music had too many grace notes in it. This is a conclusion I came to. That, you know, too many grace notes, too many adjectives. Um, my drawing line was too ornate, so aesthetically the same problem ran through all my three expressions. You know, first it shifted in the painting. I said, you know, it's too, it's too ornate. I don't like it. I want it to be bolder. When, when the drawing emboldened itself, the adjective slipped away, the rhythm increased, um, I think just knowing what you like and knowing, keeping your standards high, like I say, uh, in a certain way, there aren't that many songwriters whose works hold up on the written page. They're really good songs. They, they sing well. There's an art. Sometimes you have to sacrifice some language because it doesn't, a song has to be more direct than a poem. There isn't much time. It has to come at you more like film. You, you know, you, you, it has to have a direct hit to it. And Dylan was a master of that, of imaging and, and really confrontational direct language. So he was a major influence. As a matter of fact, you know, it suddenly occurred to me, having written poetry and put it in a shelf all as long as I can remember, not really showing it to anybody, occasionally writing something in school. When, when, Dylan, when Dylan's real gift came in, which didn't, I, in my opinion, he was kind of a Woody Guthrie copycat for a while. But when his real originality arrived, um, I thought, oh, gee, this means you can write about anything. The song is no longer love coming and going. Um, you can write on any theme, especially positively Fourth Street. You know, you got a lot of nerve to say you are my friend. And I, I thought, God, you can write about anything now, you know, <laughs> if you can write that. Johnny, we just have one more question from Jack okay. Semple here, who yeah. uh, played that song for you. I'll just pass the mic to him. Okay. Uh, well, this is, might be kind of a cosmic question. I'm, I'm not sure, but you're, you're gifted and you're, you have expertise in, in so many areas, you know, art, poetry, and music, and... Uh, That's only carrying three subjects. Well, we have to carry it. <laughs> <three subjects. laughs> but, you're, but you're a master. You're a master in all three, and, and I'm sure more. Anyways, my question is, like, why, why do you do it? Like, I mean, obviously you're good at it, you can do it. Are, are you driven by, by something that you don't know where it comes from? Do you know what I mean? Like the energy that comes through you to create all this art. Are you producing it or is it com where is it coming from? Gee, I really like doing it. I mean, um, I really like doing it. You know, I mean, it's a, all you have to do is give up a little television. <laughs> I guess that's the wrap, eh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'd just like to say, on behalf of the Saskatchewan Recording Industry Association and the province of Saskatchewan and the city of Saskatoon, we're so blessed with your presence. Thank you so much Thank for coming. Oh, um, a month ago, Karen Cleland Show and Castor, who were in the audience, I was here, well, I guess it's a little over a month, I was here in September, 
We had dinner together at that time. I get home once a year, you know, to see my folks. And, you know, so I come to Saskatoon pretty much once a year, sometimes twice. Did you ever think you were going to be getting a lifetime achievement award? Does it feel like a Awards lifetime of achievement? Awards don't mean that much to me, so we could go on from there. I mean, they're nice. They're, the, the event itself is lovely, but... Um, The award is, is when people like the music. That's the best award I can have. If it, if it is a song that is useful to them in their life, you know, like that, that provides them with some memory of some event, if it gives them some sense of n not being alone in the world, having gone through the same change, and that is a greater award than... Uh, I try not to think about the laurels. Kind of like uh, not uh, worrying about marks when you're. Yeah, you know, I think Craftsman did that. Uh -huh. He showed me the ways of the world in a certain way. What was that teacher's name again? Craftsman at, K Queen, at, Elizabeth. at Queen Elizabeth. It was very, it was very nice, you know, um, to to receive it. But I'm not really good at. Oh gee, it was just wonderful to be like a like to write. First of all. It, it's not, my life and my creativity is not at an end, so like, there's much lifetime left in me. What are your plans? What are you going to do? What direction is your music going to take? Every record's different. This one is rhythmically sparser than the one before. Um, rhythmically more complex, but fewer drums. And the bass is not being used as a rhythm instrument so much as a cello section. I heard you talking on a previous interview about how uh, your voice has uh, changed or different from, like, say, 10, 15 years ago, but you find it more manageable now. I was just wondering, like, how that is, or... Oh, I used to be on helium. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably do it right there. Threw me right off. Uh, I also heard, actually, David Crosby talking about how you were able to, uh, not being a Woodstock, how you were able to capture the feeling of Woodstock in, in your song. I was wondering how um, he would craft a song like that or how that came about. Well, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young formed, I introduced the, those boys. Right. I met Neil in Winnipeg and Crosby in Florida and, and um, Steve and I didn't know. He was in the band with, with Neil and Graham Nash I met in Ottawa. I also met Jimi Hendrix there. Rock and roll used to go on at 7.30, finish at 10.30, and folk music went later, so they don't come. If I was playing there, they'd come after hours, right? right. And then jazz was later than that. Um, <clears throat> so the first professional gig that, that CSN had was in Los Angeles. Oh, I think we played there on a Friday night, then we played Chicago, I believe, on a Saturday night. And we were scheduled to perform at Woodstock on Sunday. At that time, it was a natural, a natural, a national disaster scene. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There births and deaths going on, and terribly muddy. And mm -hmm. um, we got to the airport in New York to to go, and with our management, our mutual management, because I introduced them to their manager and agent also. Um, <clears throat> We were told that it was too difficult to get in and out, and I had to do the Dick Cabot show the following day. So management decided that the girl couldn't go, that they'd try to get the boys in. Oh, yeah. So they, the boys hired a... Geffen took me back into New York City. The boys said, uh-uh, we're going, we're not going to miss this. Mm -hmm. And they rented some kind of an aircraft, I don't know, a helicopter or a small plane. Right. And they went and showed up at my show the following day. So I could have got in and out, but I was extremely frustrated. It put me in the position of a fan who couldn't go. I watched it on television. Had I gone, you know, I would have been backstage and my perspective would have been different. Yeah. But, but I wrote the song almost immediately, like in that state of deprivation. <laughs> okay, What's sure. your uh, thoughts about coming back? Is it, is it a good feeling to come back? Do you feel like uh, you had to come back, uh, something to accept this uh, award? Or uh, what are, you, what are this, your thoughts coming back to Saskatchewan? Well, every time it's different. The last time I came back here, it, 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 it was not an enjoyable experience. This time was, was wonderful. I mean, in official capacity. The last time I came back, I was a guest speaker for the Canadian Council of the Arts. It was not a good experience. This was wonderful. What happened? Um, I was invited to speak from my heart on art and education. <clears throat> People were not properly informed, and, and basically the painters walked in, in the paper the next day. It said, we don't need some rich rock star standing up there and telling us that she's a serious artist. So in their ignorance, 
you know, you're invited to speak as a, a serious artist, but most of the audience is not informed that you in fact are, so they think you're pretentious. So there was just a misunderstanding. Do you feel that uh, coming back, talking to the music industry, do that, you know, here's this big star, she's too big for us now, did, did you worry about that? I can't speak that? for, did I worry did about Did you worry about that, that feeling of coming back? I try not to worry, I'm 50. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear uh, uh, much Saskatchewan uh, performers, many Saskatchewan performers in a soul who, who excites you? Saskatchewan performers? Yeah. I really don't know many of them. As a matter of fact, Don Freed, I'm just, he's a friend of my mother, so I've just met him the last time I was here in uh, September. And uh, I'm just getting familiar with his music. My mom's known it for a while, you know. <clears throat> it's different meeting a person. and. Hearing, you know, I really am I'm not that well acquainted with the Saskatchewan music scene. When I was here as a kid, there wasn't m much of a music scene that Do I knew of. What advice would you give them? To now, give up, and, who? up and covers. What advice would I give them? Better not to start. <laughs> Once you get in, you can't get out. People should like really know what um, fame is overrated. Um, fortune draws down sycophants. Uh, you, you, it's an interesting journey, but it's it's double-edged. It's not you know success is not a fixed point. Sophia Loren said it very well. You know, hard enough to catch the tiger, harder still to stay on its back. You know. Um, Do you plan on staying in? Do you plan on uh, fighting it out? I can't get out. <laughs> they won't let me out. <laughs> it's too late for me. <laughs> a, new album, a new album is coming out when? Um, it's almost finished. When it will be released, uh, probably sometime next year, but I'm not sure. What kind of album? What kind of music in this album? Uh, um, it's hard to say what kind of, my music is difficult to categorize, but um, it's kind of... String orchestra. Um, it's almost classical music. Um, it's hard to describe it. I don't know how to describe it. Is it a very personal album, or is it uh, something that will be very popular on the charts? Is it something you expect? Popularity can't be predicted. I, I doubt that it would be popular. I I'd be very surprised if it were popular. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking for when you're shopping around for a, a new company? Um, um, different companies that, that have approached me offer different advantages. Uh, there's a, a subsidiary of Atlantic, the advantage there, it's East West Records. The, the president of it, I'm his favorite artist in the world, so there are, the personal attention would be, you know, the executive himself. Warner Brothers has made a very good offer, probably the best. In a certain way, there are advantages to go with them in that I've already been with them. Um, they cheat you after you leave. I have a little leverage to, you know, to straighten out some of the back business by going there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the downside of it is it's a big company. Um, the advantage of staying where I am is that, that they'll never drop me. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> the, the, uh, the theme of the conference was you can get uh, to there from here. Uh, just any thoughts on how hard it is for new artists, uh, especially particularly from Canada? It's very hard. Very into No, not particularly from anything. It's like, mm -hmm. depends if you're good, you know, and, and that's relative too because a lot of stuff that that's kind of mediocre has a lot of success. So. Um, it depends what you want, you know, if you're a serious artist, that's one thing. If you want money and fame and fortune and, you know, and attention, that's an, another thing. I am not in a position to advise anything except the serious artist, and they're few and far between in, in the pop arena. When you're sitting around uh, your house, what music would you listen to that influences you right now? At home now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I listen to the splashing of the well and the mockingbird more than anything. Uh, I like a certain pocket of Miles Davis music. Mm -hmm. Nefertiti in a silent way, uh, Edith Piaf, Billie Holiday. Uh, 
Not that much pop music. Dylan from time to time. Mm -hmm. I listen to current things. My husband like eats up everything. He's a producer, so mm -hmm. everything that comes out he buys and listens to. And occasionally, you know, in, in the in the gallon, you know, and he he just throws a lot of the tapes into a drift in the back seat of his car. You know, a lot of it is one, two songs and the rest is filler. And um, right. I like the girl in the sugar cubes. I think she's adventuresome as a singer, and I like the, the world music element of. Of her. She had an, I saw her the other night on the TV. She had an interesting band from all around the world, an Indian drummer, like East Indian. And I like the sound of the percussion, the big mm. ringing drums and things. That sounded quite fresh to me. And, um, Are you planning any tour at all with this new album? You're planning on coming back to Saskatoon? Uh, any performances? I'm scheduled? thinking about it. I haven't planned anything. When was the last time you toured? 82, I think. I'm trying to figure that out. It's 10 years. How come so long? That's a long time. <clears throat> um, <laughs> well, I had polio in, in 52 or 53. Um, I beat it in a certain way, but it does... I'm allergic to air conditioning, for instance, so a, a lot of flying is really debilitating to me. So touring is does some wear and tear on my physical being. Um, even the press tours are like four and five months. You know, you do international press and you fly all around. And even that, ten interviews a day, new country, ten interviews, you know, a lot of coffee and a lot of flying. You know, that too is, is hard on the organism. Um, I like making the albums. Performance is difficult. It's uh, because I play in 50 different tunings. That also that complicates it. The, the bands that I like are the, you know, are extremely expensive. Uh, I can play with them in the studio, but to take them on the road, there's there's a lot of things to weigh out. I, I'm weighing whether to go out uh, solo, you know, just go back to or to carry a small band, or to start scouring, looking for potentially great musicians and young people, you know, like, that's quite an art, to, talent scouting, you know, to find a good young band. Um, I may do it. <laughs> What's the name of the album? Turbulent Indigo. Turbulent Indigo. Do you see yourself coming back to uh, Saskatchewan uh, to write it all your questions yeah. that you've written on the post? It's, it's, it's a fantasy of mine. I thought every time I come back here <clears throat> that to stay, you know, maybe rent a house and um, stretch out, drive out into the countryside. And it's always a rush, you know, like because the land of your childhood is a rush. Like Picasso lived in Paris, but he used to, every time he went back to Spain, when he returned to Paris, he had a whole new period. It was a stimulant to his work, although you can't really go back in certain ways. What do you miss about Saskatchewan? Well, I don't miss anything about anything, but, um, but when I come here, the wind, the, the scudding of the clouds, the space, the, the small trees, the ravine out on the edge of town, uh, um, smells, you know, you live I like those things, but I don't l long for them or anything, you know. I don't really, I've been too uh, nomadic to get into the habit of missing things. You're currently in Los Angeles? Are you in Los Angeles? Uh, then in Northern BC, I divide my time between here. And I used to have a place in New York, so it was New York and LA and Northern BC. What do you think of, of this organization that has brought you here, SRIA? Do you wish that there had been something like this when you were first starting out? I do have no regrets for the, the course that I took, you, you know. Um, I'm not sure that, I'm not an organizational, I'm not a joiner anyway, I've always been a loner. So um, I'm not sure that it would have been useful to me, although I'm sure it's very useful to, to some people. <laughs> <laughs> and the people uh, that I've met in terms of the organization are very enjoyable. Really, we've had a wonderful time, just, just a great time.
Well, pinball and darts and... <laughs> <laughs> Wondering who out there um, that you have a, have a chance to write a song with or play with, collaborate with, uh, who would be out there that you could want to uh, collaborate with right now? Um, I, I, anywhere? Anywhere. <laughs> um, well, Wayne Shorter, as far as saxophone player goes, is he's definitely, I think he's the best, you know, horn player alive. You know, um, he and I went to see Miles, the, Miles' last concert, you know, which was, we saw him two or three nights before he died. Uh -huh. um, and Miles basically handed the baton to Wayne. Wayne's person, that Wayne is a true genius and, and very, he's a seven year old, 60 something year old, very young man, very young man, mm -hmm. you know, constantly growing and evolving as, as a musician. And um, yeah, I, I play with him on every record. Um, my husband, I think, is, he, he's probably, I, I like his bass playing better than any other bass player at this time. Um, uh, I didn't use a lot of guest artists. The song I sang tonight I'm going to do with Sinead as a duet. I've already, I think it's natural for her, like, I, on all her animosity to the Irish Catholicism. <laughs> so she agreed to, to sing it as a duet. It's a good woman's duet and she's a natural, but it's a role, you know, it's a dramatic piece and I think that, that we can do a nice job with that. It's called Magdalene Laundries, was it? What was the name of it? It's called the Magdalene Laundries. Will that duet be, have both of you in the studio or are you going to do it over the phone? I'm not sure. Oh, she's working in London right now. I don't know whether I'll go there or she'll come to LA. We haven't worked the logistics out. But you prefer to do it face to face, I assume. Oh, I would, we'd, I'd be there when she does. I wouldn't just mail her the tape. Well, you know. Refer to the Sinatra thing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, right, okay. I don't know that we'd do it simultaneously. I'd probably have my vocal belt on and everything. But you'd be together. But we'd be together in the room, yeah. Sinead and I did the, the Berlin Wall, the Pink Floyd the thing Waters. on there. Roger yeah, the Roger Waters. Thing. So we met at that time. When you come to Saskatchewan uh, to visit your folks, uh, do you travel out into the country, take the time to just go outside the city and, and wander around? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I did. Well, I, I drove from Vancouver one time and I drive up to my Uncle Al's in Kilman, you know, I like mm -hmm. I like driving around on the prairie. Any prairie influences on the new work at all? The, the title song "Turbulent Indigo" is is directed to the Canadian Council of the Arts, who I'm really <laughs> pissed at. In that September incident. Yeah. <laughs> So these, these are people Canadian, in the Canadian Council of Arts who were criticizing you? In the no, 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 no. The whole thing was just silly. I, you know, Council for the Arts, my ass. You know, they don't, you know, it was just politics. You know, I, I, it was horrifying to me. They, they know nothing of art. Horrifying. <laughs> One of the, you know, it was like my godson, like, was they had to do a, some kind of sculpture in Seashell. And he's a good little kid, he's fiery, you know. And uh, he did this sculpture, and he'd seen my paintings in L.A. And all the kids were doing fish and figurative things, and, and he did this abstraction that was really good. It was really, you know, in just white finger push clay, you know, but it had a sense of what throws a shadow. It was very modern and everything. And it came down, raining down on him, and he said to them, what do you know about art? My godmother is an abstract expressionist. <laughs> I said, all right, get him, Kyle, you know. <laughs> Yes, thank you.